With the Wolverines heading out to the Rose Bowl, figured it was a good time to look back in time to when they were out in the Rose Bowl for the 1997 season. And as the author of Mountaintop, Mark Snyder, along with Nick Baumgartner, can tell you when they were out there that season, pretty good things happened. Mark, thank you so much for joining us. Oh, I'm glad to be with you. Thanks for having me. I, I think one of the things that makes college football unique and maybe kind of frustrating compared to other sports there is only one team that seems ordained to be in contention for winning a national title every season, right? And that's Alabama. Part of what makes Michigan's story so unique in 1997 is that even in that season, it didn't really seem like they belonged on that stage with all of the circumstances leading up into that season. Is that what makes the story of this season so special, both in looking back and in the writing of this book? Yeah, and in real time, actually, you know, when you're ranked 14th going into the season, that's a very rare place to come and charge to the top of of the pyramid of college football. And I think that that's because they always had that talent, but it never fit all together. Actually, there were seasons that were more talented in the years leading up to that. But then when it came to that moment, you know, everything kind of worked. You know, every break they needed to catch, they caught. So the title of the book is Mountaintop. Where does that come from? Well, what happened was that season, Lloyd Carr, he had been given a book called Into Thin Air, which was about the climbing expedition about Mount Everest in 1996 by John Krakauer, and a number of people were lost in that climbing expedition. But Carr saw it differently. He saw the people who survived and thought about why they survived. So what he did is he, he reached out to one of the survivors who actually lived in Michigan named Luke Kosicki. He brought him in to talk to the team. It was about teamwork. It was about following the rules and about, he talked about actually the turnaround time that, that, you know, if you follow the rules, then you're going to turn around and things are going to work out for you. Each player was given actually a pickaxe with his name on it and everyone in the building, in fact, even the staff, and they hung them all from the team room from the beginning of the season. And so every day that they were in that team meeting room, they saw their pickaxe and they reminded of the goal. 1997, by that point, Charles Woodson is already a Fremont Ross legend. But to become a Michigan legend, as you detail in the book, a lot of people might not realize this, but that does not happen without Miss Georgia Woodson. Absolutely. Yeah, his, Charles was always tight with his mother. He still is very close to her. And I think what she did is that she set very strict ground rules when he was growing up with his brother and they were in their family unit. You know, she kept him in line and kept him on the path of gr to greatness, essentially, near the end of his sophomore year. 1996 before the Ohio State game he was having a dispute with Lloyd Carr he wanted to make a statement and he showed up to practice you know not in his in street clothes and that was a no-no for Carr even if you're injured you got to be in your sweats and everything and it became this thing where Woodson was going to quit the team he was that upset it was going to be that moment and then you know Carr and assistant coach Vance Bedford reached out to Charles's mom and then all of a sudden Charles soon enough was back at practice he was on the task on the track and then going from there it was really smooth one of the things that I found interesting about reading this is this book has a lot of Scott Leffler in it. And if you're going through those late 90s Michigan teams, there's not a whole lot of Scott Leffler if you're just looking through box scores or maybe you're looking on the roster. Why was he so important to the writing of this book and why is he so important to that national championship team? Well, first of all, anyone who's met Scott knows he's so dynamic as a person, as a storyteller, as someone who's influential. And that's what happened really with his him in Michigan football. He went there as a very highly rated recruit, and then he hurt his arm. So he had he ended up taking a medical red shirt and was a student assistant in 1997. But he was so talented as a as someone who could see the field and had those quarterback skills, at least mentally, even if he couldn't have them physically, that what he did is he helped mentor that room. He was a defensive assistant, actually, but he still worked with the quarterbacks. Tom Brady obviously was very close with him. Brian Greasy was very close with him. And that's kind of what Scott did. You know, now he's a head coach and that ability to kind of see things and help people along is obviously some skills that he's taken into his career going on. Do you see any parallels, Mark, between this 97 team and the team we're watching right now? I think resiliency. I think that that's something this team absolutely is so resilient. They've overcome so many things. Both teams kind of had this attitude that what happens on the outside is not really their concern. All the doubters, the people, you know, this year they've doubted for different reasons than they doubted in 1997, but they're able to have that focus. And the leaders on the team also are not bombastic, you know, look at me, ego guys on both teams. And I think that that's a real big part of it too. There's some humility to it. And sometimes that helps make a great team.
Well, I mean, how about this, too? Uh, there's a chapter in the book that jumped right out at me called Stealing Signs. I knew well, you were going with that. What's old is new again? Like, what is that nugget in here? That was actually interesting because uh, while Michigan is the alleged perpetrator, this in the current situation, Michigan was the victim on that one. Um, they had actually, Northwestern came out of nowhere, right, to beat them in 1995 and 1996, and no one knew how that was happening. Well, they had seen a tell with Michigan center, Rod Payne, and so they knew Michigan's offensive plays kind of when they were happening. And then in 1997, Payne was gone, but they had a guy on their sideline, a graduate assistant, who was stealing the signals from Michigan because Michigan only had one quarterback for the week of the Northwestern game. Well, Michigan student managers figured it out kind of halfway through they ran around and told Lloyd Carr and then in the middle of the game, which never happened, student managers never talked to the coach, head coach in the middle of the game, but they did it. And uh, they broke that. They Michigan got another signal caller, ended up winning the game and saved essentially the perfect season because of that. And this year, if they win the Rose Bowl and they win again in Texas, it will not be shared. Mark Snyder, thank you so much for taking the time to talk to us. Thanks for having me. I really appreciate the time. This Michigan Bowl game update is brought to you by Danny's Cafe Rossford.